Welcome to Dialogue Across Difference, an event series hosted by the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Join us as Center Director Larry Jacobs and guests engage in conversations across the political and policy spectrum on issues of the day. Good afternoon. I am Professor Larry Jacobs. I direct the Center for the Study of Politics and Governance at the University of Minnesota's Hubert H. Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Uh, before we get started, I want to give you a heads up about a few things. One is, if you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A button, um, and there's the arrow helpfully pointing to it. That's your opportunity to become a uh, engaged and participate in our conversation. Please give us questions, give us challenging questions, give us a what are you talking about questions. Um, we really count on those good questions. So please submit. You'll see also just next to the Q&A button is a live transcript uh, feature. If you'd like to use that, just click on that um, and uh, you'll get a live transcript. The Center for the Study of Politics and Governance has a series of exciting events coming up. Here are just a few of them, and we'll be posting a number of them uh, throughout the spring. Um, coming up January 23rd at 11 Central Time, we're going to have a special program on the Medicaid program, which provides health care for lower income Americans. Uh, there are big questions about how it's managed, uh, who it's covering, and we're going to get into that. Uh, with a terrific group of national and state experts. And then February 15th, we've got a really fascinating program, Representation and Representing. It's with Lisa Dish, who is a professor of political theory at the University of Michigan. She's also a city council member in Ann Arbor, and she'll be talking about her discoveries as a democratic theorist about practicing democracy. Um, we're very much looking forward to that. All of us know have been following politics and particularly the 2024 presidential election, which is now upon us, that political parties are dominating our elections. It dominates how people behave and what they think. And so we've put together an all-star uh, group of people to uh, walk us through political parties, partisanship um, and polarization. Our moderator today is Lynn Vavrick who is a professor of political science at UCLA. Thank you so much, Lynn. Thanks, Larry. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna facilitate this conversation that we're going to have over the next hour or so. And I want to introduce our panelists who are going to engage in that conversation with us. Um, we've got joining us today, Matt Lewandowski. Matt is the professor of political science as well as the Stephen and Mary Barron Chair in Institutions of Democracy at the Annenberg Public Policy Center at the University of Pennsylvania. In addition to this, since 2014, Matt has served as a decision desk analyst for ABC News, something that uh, maybe we can get him to talk a little bit about uh, as the hour goes on. And also joining us is Robert Shapiro. Robert is the professor and former chair of the Department of Political Science at Columbia University. He specializes in American policy politics with research and teaching interests in public opinion, an area in which he has written one of the canonical works in the field. He's also interested in policymaking, political leadership, mass media, and application of statistical methods. And so I want to thank both of you for joining me today in this conversation about the stranglehold that party has on, part, on uh, voters in American politics. And I want to jump right into that, right into this question about party identification or partisanship. And I want to get us all sort of not necessarily on the same page, but maybe working from a common set of ideas 
about what political party actually is, uh, what it might mean to people. And so I'm going to ask both of you, and Matt, I'll start with you, to tell us when you think about partisanship or party identification, what work do you think that is doing? What is it made up of? Uh, what is it a reflection of for voters? Great question. Uh, so thanks, Lynn, and thanks for, for having me. Um, I think of it as being sort of um, two, two things, right? And, uh, you know, I, depending on the day, I might think one's more important than the other. Uh, one is a set of sort of group attachments, right? So being a, you know, a Democrat means that you think of yourself as being close to a bunch of groups that you think of as being affiliated with Democrats, right? So President Biden, for example, you, you know, he often talks about, you know, the Democratic Party is being composed of, you know, uh, certainly some racial ethnic minorities, union members, younger people, right? I think about different clusters of groups, right? We do the same thing on the Republican side, but it also reflects a kind of set of issue positions, right? So if I told you, oh, you know, so-and-so is a Democrat or so-and-so is a Republican, you would probably, you know, bring to mind, right, not just the kind of person that is, but the kinds of positions they have, right? So how they would feel about the Dobbs decision or how they would think about, you know, climate change or, you know, Medicare and Medicaid or, or any number of other issues. So I think of it as some blend of kind of the groups that people think of as being part of the parties and the positions that the parties typically take on these issues. I forgot to unmute. It's like, it's my first Zoom. Um, Professor Shapiro, how about you? No, the, the, the reason I'm smiling here, when I, when I think about talking about parties, especially parties in the, the electorate, I have to fall back on how we, how we actually study and measure it. Now, now I'm the old timer here, so I kind of go back to basics. And when we talk about Democrats and Republicans in the electorate, we're, we're, we're looking at um, results from data and surveys, for example. And the way party, is party identification is measured in surveys and you know, Lynn and Matt know this quite well, it's mainstream political science, is it's, it's in response to a question, uh, generally speaking, you, do you think of yourself as a Democrat, a Republican, an independent, or what? And then there's a follow-up question that they especially ask in academic surveys. If they, if they say they're a Democrat or Republican, they ask, are you stronger, are you a strong Democrat or strong Republican? And if they're an independent, they ask people follow-up, do you, you lean toward one party or the, the other? And so the pure independents there are the ones who don't lean toward, lean, lean toward any party. Now, in the old days, when people answered the question, um, and this is well known to Lynn, Lynn and Matt, uh, this is back in the you know, mid-1950s, party identification was thought of as sort of a brand or team identification, and it had a kind of an, an emotional or feeling attachment to it. Fast forward, the, the, the parties began to become increasingly distinctive on political issues and became much more ideological. And so people would, would, would respond to the question in terms of it, as identifications, but it would have a substantive policy component to it. And people were kind of favorable toward the parties in the old days as teams and brands, and then favorable with regard to issues. And now fast forward, because, and we can talk about the, the, the history of this, parties now are, are sort of, the electorate is, is are sort, of, is sort of a poisonous term. People are less likely to identify with a party. Maybe because they're, they, they, they're, at the moment, they're pretty dissatisfied with the two presidential candidates and, and maybe think well less well less well of the parties and so that's that, that's the way we need to think about the party oh i've lost i've lost bob can you guys all hear me okay <laughs> okay so Man, talk? i wonder if oh please okay i'm gonna Bob will jump back in here, hopefully in a moment. Um, Matt, think, help us think a little bit about the difference between you identify groups who people think they're a part of and issue positions. And Bob is sort of saying, um, it's, it's the way I think about myself. It's part of my identity. Um, and are those two things mutually exclusive or do you think that all of that today in 2023 is all of that playing a role? Yeah, I think all of it is playing a role and, um, you know, lots of different parts of, uh, of the, you know, political scientists spend a lot of time trying to differentiate, was it this or is it this? And I think the, you know, the best answer is for like, it's all of the above, right? So part of it is that, and I think those things, especially as Professor Shapiro talked about, as they become kind of increasingly aligned, they reinforce one another, 
right? So um, if I think of myself as someone who, you know, is a sort of MAGA Republican, I'm with President Trump, I take, you know, those sorts of positions, right? I want to build the wall, I want to impose tariffs, right? Um, that that's reinforced, that's, you know, I see myself as like that sort of thing. I see myself as close to certain types of, you know, other voters who identify as being part of the Republican coalition and I take a set of positions that line up with that. Now, figuring out what exactly, which one of those is kind of the, uh, is, you know, doing the more of the work I think is really hard, but I think they're increasingly all kind of pointing um, in the same uh, direction. Yeah, and so let, let's um, stipulate that in 2024, it is now, that uh, the data tell us that voters, most voters, nine out of 10 voters, say they can see important differences between the two political parties. So voters appreciate that the two parties stand for different things and want to do different things. And that from a democratic standpoint, that seems like that should be good. That should be normatively good. We have two choices. They are different from one another. People see that they're different and can tell them apart. Mm -hmm. And I'd like for you guys to talk for just um, a little bit about uh, whether you think that is good. Um, it wasn't always true. Uh, in the 1950s, people didn't see any difference between the two major parties. And there are lots of good reasons for that. So two things. Um, is this a good thing? But then I wanna to get to that history question that Professor Shapiro mentioned. Um, why have we arrived at this moment? Uh, let's help people understand why party has a stranglehold on people right now. And there are some very good reasons, I think normatively good reasons uh, why that's true. And um, I'd like for you guys to, to help people understand that. Uh, and Bob, why don't we start with you? Yeah, I, I think in principle, the having parties that are ideologically distinctive is a good thing. Political scientists have long thought that the American Pl Political Science Association uh, commissioned a major study that came to the conclusion that the party should be should be doing that kind of thing. But in, in, implicit or underlying that was the assumption that the parties would behave in a civil fashion and there would be this idea of sort of a loyal opposition. That is, if ele elections occurred, people would recognize the results of the election and the opposition would kind of fight hard, but fight hard in a civil way after the new party, new, new party took office. And then the other thing that happened was in becoming ideological, it involved the parties taking distinctive stances on issues that became very highly emotional. Issues like abortion, race and civil rights, gay rights, and, and those kinds of things. So emo emotions began to run high. And also the stakes began to more, become, became more, more greater because during this time, and we can talk more about some of the histories, the parties also became more competitive. And in this day and age, it's very possible now, more so in the past, for either party to have a unified Republican or Democratic government. So elections matter more. And by unified government, I mean control of the presidency, the House and the Senate, and thereby and thereby the courts. So that if a party kind of, uh, you know, rolls the table, so to speak, and, and captures all branches of government, they can enact major changes in policy. There's some constraints like the filibuster and so forth, but, but a lot can be done. And we've, we've seen it with the election of Obama, the enactment of Obama, Obamacare, Trump getting elected, tax reform. Um, elections really matter. The parties are increasingly competitive with highly emotional issues. So emotions are high anyway. And then add to that a sore loser who, who, who declares that he didn't lose the election based on, based, you know, based, based on no evidence. That really heightens the emotional level in politics and adds a different dimension. And that different dimension is the challenge to democracy itself. So Matt, how do you see this? What is the overtime element that has caused this sorting or this clarity between the parties? Yeah, I mean, it's gonna be a number of things that you know were sort of hinted at in Professor Shapiro's answer. Maybe I'll just expand it on a couple of them. Um, one of the most important ones is that it's going to be the the shift of the parties on on civil rights and race, um, right? So if we were to go back to the 1950s, right, there were were pro and anti civil rights uh, groups within each party. Um, that really begins to change. Um, so the, there's a 75 year period where there are no civil rights laws passed um, after the end of Reconstruction until 1957. Uh, then Lyndon Baines Johnson, the Senate Majority Leader. Uh, from Texas, later president, 
um, passes one because, because he wants to be president and realizes that he needs to um, be able to show that he's not captured by the, the South, which at that time was very solidly democratic, but very staunchly anti-civil uh, rights, right? Um, and so then, you know, it kind of continues to expand through the 1960s, start clarifying the 1964 and 60, uh, 64 Civil Rights Act, 65 Voting Rights Act, right? And then the parties begin um, their sort of move, move apart on that, um, you know, issue. But it's also worth pointing out that even in the 1980s and 1990s, right, revisions to the Civil Rights Act passed on strong bipartisan um, majorities. It's the sorting takes a long time, sort of, um, happen. All right. And then a sort of similar, but maybe less dramatic things happen on a whole set of other issues around abortion, around women's rights, um, et cetera, that, that kind of help add to that. But there's also one, I think, kind of interesting uh, thing that happens too that Professor Shapiro also mentioned that is maybe worth just expanding on for, for folks. And that's the, the fact that for a long time, right, it was assumed that the Democrats had a permanent lock on the House of Representatives. So they controlled the House uh, from 1954 until 1994, right? And so the longtime Republican minority leader in the House was Robert Michael of Illinois, right? Who was sort of best characterized as, you know, he was like, oh, I'm a moderate. I want to have Republicans be involved so that we have some say over the outcome. I know we're not going to control things. And then in the uh, early 1980s, uh, there's a young upstart uh, professor from the University of West Georgia who wins a seat in Congress by the name of Newt Gingrich. And he says, we're not gonna play that game, right? And Gingrich comes in and he says, no, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna sharpen these lines, right? We're gonna force Democrats to take embarrassing votes. We're gonna clarify what Democrats and Republicans stand for, right? Um, so, and the reason I bring this up, right, is not just because Newt Gingrich is sort of interesting, um, right? But also because it highlights that part of this is a strategic choice that parties make as well. So some of this, is about you know issues, and again, there's a big debate about well, are things like civil rights was that just sort of you know inevitable? That right, basically, you're going to have to recognize that the basic humanity of Black Americans, right? And I think there's probably a good argument to yes, but part of this is also the parties make strategic choices, right? That kind of sharpen these differences, you know, for the public and really you know help spur on that polarization as well. So let's think a little bit about the strategic choices that candidates and parties make. And actually, before we do that, one of the things people always ask me is they talk about the party. The party is deciding to do this. Why are why is the party positioning itself here and there? And my answer to that is always to remind my friends who don't study political science every day all day long that there is no the party. Um, and I wonder if if you guys could say a little bit about how you think of that when people ask you, you know, why is the party doing this and that um, is do you have similar answers to that? I always like to remind people we have candidates who are in parties, but it's not as if there's a, a big party, you know, uh, apparatus and, and, a, and someone telling the candidates um, or do you see it differently? Either one of you. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, it used to be it used to be emphasized that that there was not there were no sing, you know in single individual national parties, but we had we just had parties in each of each of the separate states, and that was true for a while. And then the, the national presidential election conventions were, in, were when the parties came together, and, and you can kind of see that diver in the old days. You can kind of see that diversity going on there. But but what's happened since then then is is that the, the Politics has really become nationalized in a very extensive way. So, so, so we, we we have this idea of national parties that 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 that, are, that really does exist and, and are foremost in the public mind. But the added dimension to this is that in the old days, candidates needed parties in order to run for office. Nowadays, they don't. They don't. They they can establish their own bases of support. They can establish their own sources of funding, and a lot of it has to do with campaign finance laws and so forth. So that so that the, the parties is being you know state parties matters less except for current policy making where a lot of policy making has been delegated to the states where the state parties can, can weigh in much more heavily there on what's going on in individual states. Yeah, I think one example I'll just maybe build on that a little bit that I like to think about to show the role of particular people right, as opposed to the party, right? Um, is imagine a counterfactual scenario that 
Um, you know, in 2012, right? Remember the polling was quite close. Um, you know, imagine that Mitt, um, Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan had won, right? It's now February of 2020. Romney and Ryan are, are kind of wrapping up their second term, right? And the COVID pandemic hits, right? I, you know, again, we don't get to rerun history, but, you know, I think it's pretty clear from, you know, Mitt Romney's statements, actions, he would have handled COVID very differently than Donald Trump did, right? And I think we would have seen, right, not the same way that, say, you know, President Biden handled it or a hypothetical President Hillary Clinton would have handled it, but I think something where there was maybe much less federal state antagonism, I can see something where he would have been much more supportive of masking, right, in a way that would have depolarized um, that issue, right? And so that I think, you know, would have, you know, we have all just hold hands and send kumbaya, no, but I think you would have seen maybe somewhat less polarization around certain parts of, you know, the pandemic and the pandemic response, right? So it's important to think about that, you know, yes, there are, you know, the party or the parties, right? But there's also lots of individual people that are making, you know, choices. It's also, you know, again, to throw it back, you know, one further, if John McCain had won, right, one of his longtime issues was immigration reform, right, and you could have imagined, right, maybe a different sort of path on immigration reform that then forecloses the possibility of someone like a Donald Trump kind of weaponizing that issue the way he has. So, right, a lot of these sort of individual choices, um, you know, are really important. Yeah, there, 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 in terms of individual choices, there also, there also, there's also the scenario that Trump could have handled the COVID crisis much much differently as, as well. And then in, in, in addition to that, is Trump himself has really changed the dynamics of the Republican Party in a substantial way. And, and also the Democratic Party, because when Biden, when Biden said the reason he's running is because he thinks he's the one who can beat Trump, that's had an effect there as well. Okay, so perfect. This is exactly where I wanted this conversation to land, because what I want to ask you next is about the choices that these candidates are making. Um, Matt, you just talked about a whole bunch of choices that candidates might have made or did make. And um, here's here's the question. How much of this do you think is about political leadership and candidates? Um, changing the things that people think about or the way they think about things, what they think. So sort of a top down kind of process. And how much of what we're experiencing today with the stranglehold of party on people is derived bottom up from voters, as you can think of them as sort of consumers in the marketplace, and the candidates as entrepreneurs who see where the consumers are and go there. So how do you think about the balance between political leadership and voter-driven change? Um, Bob, why don't you tell us? Well, in, in terms of the history of the polarization that's occurred, and especially the, the transformation of the parties on the, on the issue of civil rights, the you know one piece of, of common wisdom in some segments of political science is all of this stuff is really heavily leader, leadership different leadership driven. Um, it, wa it wasn't the obvious case that the Democratic Party had to become the pro-civil rights party, given that it had been an uneasy coalition of northern liberals and southern you know, conservatives and, and, so and, and, and southern ra racists um, as, as well. And so the transformation board was really, really led by leaders in the north in the northeast and then also Lyndon Johnson making, making the strategic choice, whether it was for uh, it being the right thing to do or he thought there was a strategy there by which by which the Democrats could lose the South, but pick up um, African American voters to make up for the losses of Southern Southern voters. But it, it came from political leadership. But these these things tend tend to have a, a dynamic of their own. Trump himself um, is 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 someone. It, it, that process that occurred was leadership driven by Donald Trump himself, and and he um, may have tapped uh, sentiments in, in the electorate, but it, it, but he he was the one who moved first, and pe and voters rallied around him. The irony here is, once this occurs, occurs the voters hold their leaders' feet to the fire, and it becomes difficult for them to moderate or change their views. Look look at look at what, what's happened with Trump as he's as he's tried in public gatherings to claim credit for the COVID vaccine and all that. People don't want to don't want to want to hear that kind of thing. Yeah, no, I think just to I actually. I think that that was a great, great answer. I would just add two, two sort of examples of that. I think one is, 
Uh, you know, again, this is always take this with a grain of salt because this is based on all those like anonymous source reporting, you know, from like the Mitt Romney book and, you know, the, the Lenin and Rucker book after the 20, you know, 20 election is that, you know, allegedly off the record, many Republican senators wanted Trump gone, but they were afraid that if they voted to, you know, either impeach Trump or, or convict him in the Senate, right, or at least disqualify him from running for office again, they feared backlash, right, from the from the voters. Um, and I think that that's maybe that's one of the kind of maybe strongest examples, right. Uh, of that, but I think we also see a little bit of this playing out, maybe with President Biden and some of the constraints over um, the Israel, the you know conflict between Israel and um, Hamas, right, in Gaza, right, with people from both sides. Um, you know, Biden is trying to give one message, but there are you know different parts of the party that are, are kind of pushing him on both sides there as well. And we and we also saw in, in the Republican. You know, competition for the for the for the nomination. The Republican candidates were, were constrained in terms of not wanting to upset Trump's the, the Trump's base, which they would need in order to win a general election. Okay, so we've got these candidates who maybe see some support for their ideas in the electorate, but they lead by um, waking those attitudes up or prioritizing those attitudes among voters. And then other candidates have to play now in this new um, landscape. And, and so now we have some questions that were sent in in advance and, and some that are being populated in the, in the Q&A that I, I want to talk about, which is what does this mean for voters who have moderate positions? M most voters have moderate positions on issues. And, um, but now they've got these two political parties who are farther apart on average in terms of their positions on policies than they have been in our lifetimes. How are these voters who are essentially in the middle or voters who identify as independents, who don't side with a political party even when pushed? How do you see those voters making sense of this political landscape? Um, and are they up for grabs, particularly um, the independents, but also the people who call themselves Democrats who are moderates and people who call themselves Republicans who are moderates, which just so everybody is clear is most people. Uh, most people will think of themselves as some kind of a moderate. Uh, does that mean they're up for grabs? And what can the parties do to attract these voters? Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think these are the the people who in some ways are, are the kind of core, core group um, that I think of these people as being very important because, you know, if you're a really strong Democrat or really strong Republican, like, okay, yeah, we can construct some scenario where you don't vote for your party, but most of those people are going to vote for the party, right? And that's because they're being brainwashed by the party, right? It's because they, it's all those things we talked about at the beginning, right? They, for a variety of reasons, you know, feel best represented by that party. But it's the people in the middle who tend to actually sort of, um, you know, to use a very old phrase, be the, the gods of, of punishment and reward, right? Um, or maybe vengeance and reward is the quote, um, right? The idea that they're kind of looking at the, the party's performance and, and kind of giving credit where credit is due and blame where, where blame is due. Um, so looking ahead at 2024, I actually think that one of the most important groups might be the group, uh, and a lot of these people are gonna be these moderates, who I think of as the sort of double negatives, right? So people who like neither Biden nor Trump. Right, um, and so what they end up doing, right? Uh, you know, I think will ultimately be, you know, in many ways, one of the key stories of the 2024 election. Typically, we would say they tend to favor the challenger, except that it's not exactly clear to me that we can think of Trump as the challenger here. I mean, I guess he is like technically, but it's a, you know, it's been since I think 1912 since we've had, or 1916, something like that, since we've had two incumbents running against one another, right? And if you look very much at the rhetoric, right? Uh, Trump's rhetoric is very much like, you can take what happened from 2016 to 2020, contrast it what happened, you know, 2021 to 2023, and you can see which one of those you like better. So it's a somewhat, it's a very different story than we're used to hearing about, um, you know, the sort of classic incumbent challenger, you know, sort of dynamic there. 
Yes. And, and Bob, I'm going to ask you the same question, but I want you to focus a little bit. You have um, this tremendous experience with public opinion data and your experience at Roper and all of this, these double negatives that Matt just mentioned. Um, I don't, I don't like Trump and I don't like Biden. Should people really interpret the answers to those polling questions as meaning that voters are so dissatisfied with these candidates that, you know, they can't consider voting for them. That's that's the old way of interpreting that kind of question. But is that is that right right now? Maybe if you could talk a little bit about that, that would be well, helpful. Well, well, two things, just an, an answer to Matt's query about who's the real incumbent here. It's Biden who's the real incumbent here because he's he's in the White House and being held responsible for what is what is going on here. Um, these people who, who feel negative toward the candidates, they're 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 going to be influenced in the end by the choice between the Democrat the, the Democrat and the Republican here, and 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 you have you have partisanship kind of trumping no pun intended, um, moderation and 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 so forth. The the independents who are independent leaners are are going to lean are going to lean toward the party. Also, their perceptions of performance are clouded by their partisanship. That is, people's perceptions of the economy differ between Democrats. The, the, differ between Democrats and Republicans as well. And so you, you really have this, just to use a term that uh, Lynn and her colleagues um, have, have promoted, they're, they're pretty calcified along partisan lines here. And, that, and, that, and, that, and that's, that's going, going to dominate here, given and the choices are gonna be the choices. They, they, all the voters would prefer different candidates running and, and the dynamic here would be very different, but partisanship is gonna is going to dominate. And those, 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 you call them moderate voters, you call them independents, but they're swing voters. There are probably fewer of them because of difference because of partisan attachments, but there are enough of them to make a difference in the election, particularly in particular states. Okay, so let's uh, let's carve out a little bit of time right now to talk about what's going on in American politics in the coming week, which is the Iowa caucus, and this is an intra-party contest but an interesting one for the future of political parties in America nonetheless. Um, let's stipulate that Trump is ahead and uh, among Republican voters, he is very popular. And I'm curious to hear uh, both of you talk about why you think that is. Why is Trump popular among Republican voters? And uh, Nikki Haley, Ron DeSantis, are either one of them well positioned to dislodge Trump as the front runner and potentially the Republican Party leader? Um, what would have to happen in the next, let's say, 14 days uh, for that to, to be true? And how likely is it? Um, Bob, what do you think? Well, I, I think what's going on here is that that that, that Trump has, has turned the Republican Party into you know, into into his party here, and when when Trump Trump descended the stairway in the you know in the 2016 election, he he really tapped into a level of voter voter dissatisfaction, voter, voter dissatisfaction with changes in the economy that were losing them behind. The fact that the Republican Party now is the party of the of the white working class is really is really extraordinary extraordinary here. Also, just I mean just to oversimplify. Um, the reason he's he he and the Republicans are so strong is it's really been played out in the context of those those Senate hearings where the, those university professors testified about uh, about anti-Semitism on campus and, and and how they responded and then also the the current response to the Claudine Gay at Harvard and so forth. Trump really has tapped those those kinds of views and 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 emotions in in a very big way, and and if not in a way. That leads voters to vote for Trump. It's in a way that leads voters to vote against the Democrats, and that's what's that, that, that's what's driving this very heavily. I think. Yeah, I, I think I'll I'll build on one thing and then answer maybe a slightly different part of it as well. I think the interesting thing that Trump, I think that's exactly right that Trump has kind of remade the Republican Party as the party of, of Trump. Um, but I think it's also interesting, and this is something uh, that was alluded to in an earlier answer that. That's also then subsequently remade the Democratic Party, right? Um, so talking to a strategist a few years ago, he said the best uh, GOTV thing the Democrats ever invented was Donald Trump, right? Because precisely, you know, those sorts of college educated voters who their parties increasingly trying to appeal to, right, are really react very strongly to Trump and a lot of his um, sort of statements. So in that way, 
right? He's sort of, even though he's not the incumbent, right? He's kind of pulled the whole kind of, you know, political system sort of around him. And I think part of what was sort of challenging for, for Trump or for DeSantis and Haley then is that, uh, and again, as we alluded to earlier, you have to walk this very fine, because if I told you from the outset, right, that you have someone who's facing 91 indictment counts in both state and federal courts, you'd think like, oh, well, everyone's going to attack that person, right? But it just, it's very hard because he's, you know, the most popular figure in the party and everyone's hoping that someone else will knock him off and then you will just stand to pick up and benefit um, from that. And I think you're seeing from the way people are moving that they're all, you know, sort of playing for second in a way that they're hoping to, you know, so if Trump wins in 24, right, um, then you can become the inheritor of that. Um, but I think what, what uh, you know, will be very interesting to see over these next couple of elections is, do these people who were brought into the party by Trump, are they pro-Trump or are they Republican? And I don't think the answer is super clear because if you look at 2022, admittedly a midterm election, um, a lot of the pro-Trump candidates actually did quite poorly, right? Um, so, you know, uh, not in Pennsylvania, right? The, you know, Trump endorsed both people, right? Um, did poorly, right? The same thing in, um, in Michigan, in Arizona, right? In Nevada, the governor wins. But um, a lot of these candidates, right, who, who very strongly embrace this kind of Trumpian mantle, then don't do quite so well when Trump's on the ballot. We saw something sort of similar in 2018. So I think that'll be a really interesting thing to watch, you know, once Trump, you know, fades from the scene about how those voters, you know, sort of respond. So just to, to recap, neither one of you see a real avenue for a candidate who is not Donald Trump coming out of Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, getting the nomination. If you were betting today, you would bet on Trump being the nominee. Yeah, right. I, I, if I if I had to bet, I would bet on I'd bet on Trump being the nominee. I mean, and you, I mean, you have to think of of the scenarios here. One one would be that the polls aren't really measuring people's actual respect, you know, or behavior going forward. And we're going to find out very quickly in, in Iowa and New Hampshire whether whether or not that's that's the case. The 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 the, the path for for Nikki Haley or DeSantis would would be either for them to, to miraculously win in Iowa or New Hampshire or to do well enough. That they they could gain what would political scientists refer to as momentum here. That is, people will pay, start paying attention to them, and they, they they may reconsider, and they may reconsider in the context of uh, the the question: Do I care more about Trump, or do I care more about winning the election? And a good case can be made is that that Haley or DeSantis could do better against the Democrats and the Republicans, and also bring with them um, maintaining control of the house for the republicans and gaining and gaining the senate if they're if, if they're thinking if they're thinking rationally they should probably be be doing be doing that but that doesn't that doesn't look like the case and even even if haley does well in, in iowa and new hampshire she's currently behind by a huge amount in her home state of south carolina which is absolutely stunning and now matt nikki haley on the campaign trail has said repeatedly you know donald trump he he pulls in really close there with joe biden and uh you know when we ask voters who they would but, but me like I'm 13 points ahead of Joe Biden. What is what's wrong with that logic as a as a polling expert and a decision desk analyst? What is she forgetting? What is she missing when she says that? Um, yeah, I think she's missing just how you know Republican voters feel about this. I mean, it is this sort of just studying um, thing that I think that's right. I think if Nikki Haley were the nominee, she'd be the first Republican nominee since 2004 to win the majority of the popular vote. Right. Um, I think if, you know, if you like held a gun to my hand and said, who do you think is going to win? I think it's probably Joe Biden, but it's going to be like super close and it's going to come down exactly like it did in, in 2020 to the same like handful of states. Um, I don't think that would be the case if Haley won, because I think um, she would like lots of Democrats who really dislike Donald Trump, but also are unhappy with Joe Biden would you know, move to Nikki Haley because she's not Donald Trump. Um, but I think for a lot of Republican voters, and there's two things. One, I think they really like Trump more than like anyone else. And two, if you ask them, they think Trump is really going to, to win. Um, 
you know, that they, they think that, you know, there was uh, maybe some sort of malfeasance in 2020, right? And they think that this time, right, with the economy going this way, there's no way that Biden wins. I don't think that's a correct assumption. Um, but I think that's the story they, you know, that they're going with. And so I think that's why it's hard um, for Haley to gain traction with that argument, even though I think it probably, you know, again, we want to, I don't think we'll ever see that world, but I think it probably would be right. Yeah, I wish we could see that world because um, I would make a bet with you right now because I think I'm on the other side. I think even if Haley were the nominee, this 2024 election is going to be really, really close. Um, again, because of, I'm going to put in quotes, the stranglehold of party, the two worlds that the parties want to build are really different from one another, even the world Nikki Haley wants to build and the world that Joe Biden wants to build. And I think that that is what makes these elections close. But I also agree with you that we're not going to see that world. So we'll never, we'll never be able to resolve our, our hypothetical bet. Um, we have let a me lot. Throw, let, me throw, let me throw a wrench into this. Yeah, sure. If, yeah. If, if for some reason, in some way, Nikki Haley were quickly to become the Republican nominee if it became apparent. Would would Joe Biden stay in the race? Yeah, I think I, that's the other. I, I, mean, I think. In, in the so for what it's worth, I don't. This is from a J.P. Morgan report. This is not from like a political sense from some <laughs> you know finance person. Their argument is that um, <laughs> exactly. I said I I. I, somehow I've ended up on like a lot of these very random mailing lists. I think people just like <laughs> sign off lots of professors' <laughs> emails and then I occasionally look at them and I'm like, oh. Um, but the argument is basically that um, Biden is going to wait to capture the, um, the nomination of the convention and then ballot for health reasons, um, which I don't think that's, there's any like logic in that. But yeah, no, I mean, Biden has made it pretty clear he's running because of Trump. So then I think that's right. Then it is this whole other ball game where um, then the field that probably changes everything in, in an even bigger way. Yeah, it's hard for me to believe that 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 that's, you know, candidates want to win elections and he wants to he's decided to do this. And you just have to think about if you're that speech writer, you've got to write the speech that, oh, now that Nikki Haley's the nominee, I'm going to step down. I mean, maybe it writes itself. I heard you. I heard you say you weren't thrilled with my candidacy, but no, no politician could give that speech. Um, so I, I think it's I think I it's hard for me to imagine how that goes. Um, but we have a ton of questions in the Q&A that have come in from people wanting to ask you guys about third parties. And given the high level of dissatisfaction with the two parties, uh, the double negatives, as Matt has called them, why don't we have more third party movements? Why don't we have more independent candidates? And do you think that a third party is viable? I'm summarizing all these questions that have come in. And do you think that even an independent candidate who runs in 2024 and gets one or 2% of the vote could swing the election um, to one or the other of the major party candidates. So, you know, with our third parties and why hasn't, if there's so much dissatisfaction, why hasn't something new emerged? How do you, how do you help people understand that? Bob, you want to take a crack at it? Well, I mean, the, the, the problem here is structural. With regard to the presidency, we have this, the whole electoral college system, first what we call first past the post you know, plurality elections. It makes it very difficult for a third party. The last successful looking third party we had was Ross Perot, who got 19% of the vote, which was really impressive, except he got 19% of the vote everywhere and, and didn't didn't uh, win any electoral votes. Pa past 30 par third party candidates have, have gotten um, electoral Just, votes. But it, that, explain for people, unpack for people the relationship between first past the post and yeah. the electoral college. It, it, yeah, explain the, how those. The way the way it works is that the the electors uh, are allocated in such a way that that in the in the current system the candidate who gets who, who wins the the vote in a particular state gets all the electoral college votes, and that makes it difficult for a third party. So Ross Pro gets nineteen percent of the vote. He doesn't get nineteen percent of the electors. He he gets no he gets no electors. That's the that that's the, the puzzle here. Um, past third parties in in. Um, uh, Strom Thurmond, um, Eddie Roosevelt back in the day, uh, were able to pick up some electoral 
electoral votes. And that, that kind of upsets the electoral college calculation affecting the possibility that, that one of the two party one of the two parties would get a majority of the electors, in which case the election goes to the House of Representatives and that's a different dynamic here. So, so we, we currently have third parties who aren't who aren't polling well. They're, they're polling well enough to get get a certain percentage of the vote, which could affect the outcome of the election in particular states. Even one percent could affect how the election goes in states such as Georgia, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. And so they, they they can they can make a big difference. We saw it. We saw this in the 2000 election. We saw it in 2016. Um, so they they can matter, and and we have to watch them. Yeah, I think I would would endorse everything Professor Shapiro said there. That you know, if it you know the third party candidate is pulling a few percent in you know California, no big deal. But if they pull that in you know one of the state one of those key states that Professor Shapiro named, it's a huge issue. Um, on why we, we, you know, there's, I think he pointed to the, the structural issue being a great one. There's also a really nice report, you can look it up online, written by Lee Drutman at um, the New America Foundation. Um, and he used something called the Voter uh, Survey, which is this big uh, survey funded by the Democracy Fund. And they asked people in 2018 a lot of different questions. Um, and, you know, they ask, do you want a third party? And, you know, over, overwhelming majority of people say, yes, of course, we need more parties. And they're like, okay, what should they stand for? And basically what people want is they're like, I would like the party of Matt Lewandowski, right? Not me personally, <laughs> their own party, right? I'm sure um, they like that. <laughs> um, yeah, please, let's not have that party, actually. Um, so that, you know, everyone sort of would like the party that kind of fits their own individual position. And they do a really nice analysis showing like, well, there's actually not really a space where it makes sense for a third party to enter, right? Because parties are strategic, right? They tend to try and stake out these positions or candidates within them try to stake out these positions to, um, you know, capture these parts of the electorate. So it's not, even though you can sort of say like, oh, isn't there this big space in the middle? Right, it's that people don't. It's not like everyone's just at one point in the middle. They're spread out on a lot of different issues in ways that would make it hard for one party to kind of come together and capture those folks. Yeah, I I like to think about that exact point about what positions, what policy positions will this third party have, and that's where it gets tricky. Today we've talked about this that we're fighting today over these um, identity-based policies. And that, that's different than saying we're fighting over identities, um, right? We're fighting over identity-based policies, immigration, the Muslim ban, the border wall, abortion, things that are tied to identity, same-sex marriage. Uh, for most of my lifetime, politics in America has been contested on something totally different, what we would call the New Deal issues, the role and size of government, the tax rate, whether small businesses should pay more or less in, in taxes. These, this new dimension of conflict, this identity dimension, in my mind, does not lend itself to compromise the way that the previous dimension did. If one party wanted government to have a big role in people's lives and the other party wanted it to have a smaller role, a compromised position could be somewhere in the middle. If the tax rate was 50% or 30%, we could compromise at 38%. But we can't compromise on same-sex marriage. You can't be married on Mondays and Tuesdays, not on Wednesdays and Thursdays, and only if you want to be on Fridays. And so the parties have to take these positions. And Matt, you said earlier that the positions are now more highly correlated within party. So that if someone is for the border wall, you also know a lot about how they feel about a whole bunch of other issues. And do you think that that's also what limits the opportunity for a third party? That a third party might emerge and say, we are going to be you know, for the border wall, um, but we are also going to be against um, abortion and, uh, you know, sorry, that's the wrong direction, uh, for the border wall uh, and for abortion, um, you know, for life. And so that then voters, there aren't very many voters in that space that the parties have understood where the voters are. Um, or do you think this third party could lead voters to those positions 
So that sort of in the in the words of the baseball movie, if you build it, voters will come. What what do, how do you guys think about that? I think it would be really tough. Uh, so the to go back to Nikki Haley. In the first Republican debate uh, this summer, she actually gave us this amazing response uh, on abortion, right? Where she kind of came out and said, like, can't we all agree? And she tried to strike this very moderate, you know, sort of thing saying, like, look, you know, we have to stop demonizing women. Um, there, there are not 60, you know, votes in the Senate to ban abortion, right? This is, it is what it is, right? And we have to find ways to kind of, you know, like, on this. And it went nowhere. Um, and I think that's, it's just, it would be tough to think about though, like how you're gonna move people on some of those things. Not that they can't be moved, right? On some of these issues, right? Cause we've seen people move, you know, change their opinion on some of the stuff. It's just hard to figure out exactly like how that would happen. So there are some yeah. limits to political leadership. Yeah. yeah, I think they're lim yeah, I think they're limits here. I mean, they're, 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 they're trying to, as we say, burn the, burn the candle on both ends. And they, they'd, they'd have to pick and choose positions on issues and they would leave themselves vulnerable on kind of, you know, kind of both sides, unless they sort of emphasized something boring, good government performance, civility in politics and so forth. I think, I think that's, a, that would be enough there for a party like no labels to siphon off some Democrats. But I, but I, but I think, the, I think the Republicans, um, Trump's base is, is sufficiently entrenched there that um, if the vote got split in that way, that would benefit the Republicans. Okay, we're going to pivot because we also have a bunch of questions that have come in from audience members about polling, um, something that both of you know a tremendous amount. And people basically want to know, you know, given that nobody answers their phone anymore and uh, landlines are going away, that must mean it. So the first thing is, is this true? That must mean that the reach of political pollsters has been minimized. So they're not able to contact as many or the same kind of people that they were in the past. And does that, should that make us lose confidence in polls? And so maybe the question that I'll ask you to talk about is, um, you know, should people lose confidence in polls now, or is the science of polling such that this is sort of the zenith of polling? There's more science happening now than ever, and we should have more confidence in polling. Um, there definitely have been changes, and please feel free to give your description of what those changes are and what you think of them so people can understand how polling is being done. Um, but what's your confidence level, and how should people think about this? Um, Professor Shapiro, what do you think? Yeah. Well, uh, well. First of all, as 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 we say in, in polling, there's there's more error in polling today than, than there used to be because of because of non-response. The big non-response bias was not pick, not picking up enough Trump voters in the uh, in, in, in the elections. Now here, the bias in the problem in polls is is election polls, not polling in general. That is the kinds of biases that occurred in the election polls. You don't find in polls of the of the adult population. Even even with even with non-response, you can compensate pretty well by weighting the data to the characteristics the characteristics of the population as a whole. If you're undersampling Trump voters, it leads to some bias, but not when you're polling attitudes toward issues and other things. And so, when the government does its census and when, when pollsters poll on political issues thus far, it, it's still so far so good. There could there could be warning flags um, down the road. The problem now is there's there's more error. Um, pollsters have tried to compensate compensate for the biases in different ways. They're, they're, they're more sophisticated ways of, of model, modeling uh, modeling the electorate that, that, that can get can get can get pollsters pretty far. But still there's more error there. Uh, in, in the context of current current polling, the, the gaps between, between Trump and Biden are such that I, I think any pollster would still say this is this is going to be a close election no matter no matter how you how you cut it. If one candidate were enormously ahead, I think in these primary polls, what would be stunning is that if 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 Trump's, Trump's lead in all the polls disappears in the election, that will. Uh oh, that be was pretty stunning because <laughs> if his if his big lead disappears, that will be surprising. I think, yeah. um, and and uh, Matt, sometimes I think that the the closeness of these last couple presidential elections 
that's hard for polls. Like when you're talking about getting it right and the outcome is turning on 20,000, 30,000, 70,000 votes, um, that's a that's a tall order. Um, how much does that also play into people's uh, lack of confidence? Yeah, I think that that's um, one thing I'd like to emphasize to you students or when I talk to the public is that polls are also just a snapshot in time, right? The question is, if the election were held today, how would you vote, right? And part of what happens too is that you know people change their mind, they're undecided, right? Um, so there's a lot a lot going. Um, on there. But I thought it might be be worth is that Professor Shapiro did a good job talking about in some of the non-response biases, talking a little bit about how polling happens, right? So there's sort of two, two ways you can do it, right? Um, I don't think there's anyone who just does unstructured phone poll, like true RDD anymore. So there's two main ways that people do it. One is um, what's called RBS or registration-based sampling, where you take the voter file um, from a, a state. So each secretary of state keeps a list of registered voters in the state. It's true in all states except North Dakota, which doesn't have voter registration. Um, and then you use that to sample people and, and you can do different things to try and increase that. So you can send people like a letter ahead of time uh, and stuff and, and do um, that sort of thing. Um, you know, that's still, it, it's hard, you know, even a really good poll like the, um, the Des Moines Register Iowa poll, right, gets a response rate of about 6%. Because um, even doing a lot of stuff, it's hard to get people to, to pick up the phone. Um, thank you, spam calls. Uh, the second way you can do that is you can impanel people online. So you recruit people um, typically uh, through some sort of like address-based sampling and you invite them and you say, oh, I'm you know working with the NORC, um, which is a academic polling firm in the University of Chicago, or you know, there's various other groups that do this. You can say, we'd like you to join our panel. We'll pay you to take each survey. And then you have a set of people you have so-called impaneled, right? Because you're going to survey them again and again over time, right? Maybe you sample to get a big group of those people and sample them. And uh, you know, that tend that has tended to work reasonably well. I think, you know, what we don't have a very good handle on is there are, is how different are the types of people who agree to be in one of those polls? How different are they from the people who, you know, we know they're different from people who would just never answer the phone, but the type of person who maybe in 1992 would have answered like an occasional poll, but isn't going to kind of stay in one of these polls. Where you typically have to take like one poll a month to stay in these things, right? Someone who's not going to do that, right? How different are they? And that's a little bit hard to do. That said, um, the, you know, a lot of the best work, and this has been done by the Pew Research Center, which just did another report um, right before the end of the year, showing that actually, you know, they're, because they now run one of these, you know, probability-based polls um, with these panels that they recruit, it's called American Trends. Um, and they can still actually capture a lot of benchmarks where we know the true answer from the federal government, right? So like the, what percentage of Americans, um, own a passport, right, because we know the number of that, right, those sorts of, of things. And it, it, they do actually a pretty good job. Yes. So political polling um, may be harder than polling on questions like, do you have a passport or do you make charitable contributions? But the science of polling has uh, kept up with all the challenges of polling. Um, and so confidence, just as this is going to be our last, the last word is uh, confidence in polling should still be it's better, it's the best indicator we have of public opinion, agreed? Yes, much like yes. the Winston Churchill quote about democracy yeah. being yeah. part of government, except for all yeah. the other yeah. tried. Better than, better than man on the street interviews, better than focus groups. As a thermometer of public opinion, we still have confidence in, in polls. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, sadly, we're out of time and we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I want to thank all the people who wrote in with questions that we didn't have time to get to. Um, I have been scrolling through them and they would make for great graduate seminar fodder. Uh, so hopefully we'll have an opportunity to all get back together and talk them through. Professor Levin Dust. Professor Shapiro, thank you so much. Thank you to uh, the University of Minnesota and to all of you for joining us.